Okay, guys, thanks for joining me for this uh, third of three Zoom lectures on chapter 13. So we want to pick off, pick up where we left off um, on the preceding Zoom lecture. So we're going to be finishing up the last section, uh, actually the last two sections or so of the chapter. Epidemiology. A few things we want to kind of define here as we get into this study of disease and populations are terms like a reservoir and source. So when we talk about the reservoir of a particular microbe, a pathogenic microbe perhaps, although it doesn't have to be a pathogen, we're talking about where you typically find that out in the natural world. Okay, it could be in you, in me, in the pond in the backyard, in the soil of our garden. It could be a whole host of different primary habitats that that pathogen typically resides. Source is the object or individual from which the infection is acquired. Now that could be from the reservoir, but doesn't have to be, okay? It could be from the source of contaminated lettuce that contains the salmonella pathogen. It doesn't mean that necessarily salmonella is, is normally found growing in, in that lettuce, but somehow perhaps got there. And then of course was disseminated out through grocery stores and people ate that and got sick. So the two aren't mutually exclusive. Within a living reservoir, we could talk about an individual who is a carrier. I think we all have a sense of what that term kind of means. That individual is sheltering that pathogen, may not even know that they're doing so, but could be inadvertently spreading that to other individuals. And whether they actually got sick from that disease caused by that pathogen or not, we don't know. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. We talk about somebody, for example, who's had COVID-19 was asymptomatic, but could very well be a carrier at spreading that within the family group, let's say, or at work or wherever that individual you know, is. And oftentimes um, that individual is doing so passively, doesn't, doesn't realize it. And we saw the, show the example here in, in this uh, sketch of an individual, a nurse who is caring for patients, but may indirectly, unknowingly pass that pathogen from patient one to patient two. And we'll be talking about nosocomial infections toward the end of, of this chapter. Um, and we'll begin to understand, and I think those of you in the nursing field un do understand acutely, just how easy it can sometimes be to inadvertently pass on a pathogen from one individual to another, from one patient to another. Even though we set up roadblocks for that process in terms of policies at the hospital or the nursing facility, it still can happen. We have to follow these, these rules very stringently to minimize this process of, of contamination by healthcare workers. Asymptomatic, as the name implies, somebody who is without symptoms, who is feeling great, is very active, but could very well be passing that bug on. Uh, an incubation carrier, somebody who is spreading the bacterium or the virus during the time it is in that incubation phase uh, of the infection. Remember we talked uh, in the earlier um, lecture about the various stages in the course of infection, the incubation, prodromal, period of invasion, and then the convalescent period. So during the time the bacterium uh, has taken uh, hold within the individual, the person doesn't feel sick, but is harboring that bug and could, of course, be passing that on to other individuals unknowingly. On the opposite end of that infection, 
process is the convalescent carrier who is getting better, recuperating, feeling better, but is continuing potentially to shed those viable microbes on to somebody else. So when we talk about the, again, stages of infection, whether it's the incubation, prodromal, invasion phase, or convalescent period, in some diseases, that individual could be shedding the bug. In other individual, in other uh, infections or diseases, maybe by the time you get sick and by the time you're convalescing, there is little to no chance of you shedding the bug. So it really truly depends upon the pathogen and the disease or infection that we're talking about, and, and perhaps even the individual who is harboring the pathogen. Chronic carrier, somebody who is feeling fine, has long since gotten over the illness, but now throughout you know, the period of several years potentially, um, continues to shed that infectious agent, doesn't realize it. And the example, one of the most famous historical examples is one that I provide a link to, Typhoid Mary is a short little video that you should watch of her. Um, she passed on infectious bugs for many, many years. Yeah, so make sure you check that out. She was a cook. She infected hundreds and hundreds of people. Very interesting. Let's talk about the role that animals play, both as reservoirs of pathogens as well as possible sources of infection. Now, I think you've heard me use the term vector in the past. Um, for example, when we talked about malaria back in lab, uh, I think it was the second week, we described some different uh, pathogenic protists and we looked at a few slides, remember? Uh, one of them was of plasmodium. And we looked at a slide of um, some blood cells, red blood cells that were infected um, with that particular uh, protist. And we described the fact that in order for you to get malaria, you have to be basically bitten by a mosquito. It's called the Anopheles mosquito. That's the genus, Anopheles. Um, and so in that sense, we used, I used the term vector that the mosquito vectored that protist to the individual who got malaria. Or remember we talked about trypanosomiasis, which is caused by a trypanosome protozoan. Um, trypanosoma is the genus. And you might remember us describing the fact that there was another kind of bug. Um, it's called the, the kissing bug that um, one particular species of trypanosome can get into you if the kissing bug bites you right on the edge of your mouth there where the skin is very, very thin. And so that particular, uh, again, disease caused by a protist that was carried by an arthropod, an insect. Uh, tsetse fly, right? You've heard of that? Vector for African sleeping sickness. Lyme disease, you've heard of that, right? The vector is a tick that bites you and you get the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. So there's a, a ton of different examples that we could look at and study um, whereby arthropods typically, these, this means joint footed, things like fleas and mosquitoes and flies and ticks can carry the bacterium, can carry the virus, can carry the protist that causes the disease. Even some larger animals, both birds and mammals actually, can um, often also vector some pretty nasty pathogens. Um, pigs are notorious for carrying influenza virus. In fact, if you look at the incidence of flu in the world, many times flu viruses originate in pigs and because farmers work very uh, intimately with pigs, especially in smaller farms in Asia, where you might have two or three pigs um, that, you're, that you're feeding you know, next to your home, um, that's often a source for flu 
um, viruses. They start in pigs. Yeah. Um, you may have heard of West Nile virus carried by uh, crows. So if you find dead crows, which is not typically likely, but once in a while you see one laying there on, on in your yard or a, along uh, a street or several crows, and you know that it didn't get hit by a car or you know met met its death in some obvious way. It looks pretty healthy and untouched. It couldn't have died as a result of West Nile virus. Um, different kinds of birds, if it's a bird flu maybe, um, birds can carry different kinds of pathogens. And bats have long been linked with different kinds of, of viruses. In fact, we'll talk a little bit later uh, about COVID. And uh, there's one theory that suggests that uh, in Wuhan, in those markets um, where people were buying basically uh, game animals, um, those that were harvested out in the wild, um, that perhaps it was a bat um, that harbored that particular virus, the COVID um, coronavirus. And that's, that was the source of infection that infected somebody at that market. And then it just spread from there. Not to put a, a bad uh, name to bats because of course they're very important in, in eating lots of mosquitoes and so forth. So I don't want people to start to go out and start, start to kill bats or advocate killing lots of bats, but, but uh, some, some diseases can be carried by bats. Um, we can and should differentiate between what are called biological vectors and mechanical vectors. So a mosquito like the Anopheles mosquito that causes malaria would be thought of as a biological vector in the sense that in order for the plasmodium to get into you and cause malaria to you, it relies on the mosquito in its life cycle. Because if another mosquito, let's say you get malaria from a bite, and then another mosquito comes and lands on you to bite you, it picks up a form of that protozoan and then carries it to another individual, bites them, gives them malaria. So without the mosquito vectoring the protist, the life cycle of the protozoan there, the, the plasmodium would be, would be stopped in its tracks. So it's vital for the life cycle of the protozoan, the, the mosquito is. So we would, again, think of that as what's called a biological vector. A mechanical vector would be an example of an animal, often it's an insect, that isn't necessary to complete the life cycle of the pathogen, but rather just simply transports it from one individual to another. It does not harbor the um, pathogen in it, for example, like the mosquito does. The, the mosquito actually harbors a form of that plasmodium in its, in its internal structure. But a housefly, for example, as they mentioned here, that lands on garbage, picks up the pathogen on its feet and its mouth, and then flies somewhere else and lands on another, say, food source and transmits those spores or transmits that bacterium. And then you somehow eat that food and you get sick. Okay. It's sort of a random sort of event uh, in terms of how the housefly transported that, that pathogen. But flies, as it mentions here, can spread a lot of different kinds of viruses, bacteria, protists, even certain helminth worm um, cysts can be passed via flies. So flies are important mechanical vectors. When we talk about an infection that moves from an animal to a human. We refer to that as a zoonosis infection. And when we look at these zoonoses, and we'll look at a table of those in just a moment, there are a lot of diseases that are endemic or common in animals but then make the leap to humans 
and then we end up getting sick. And so animals, certain types of animals often harbor these pathogens. And if we want to eradicate the disease, we would, we would really have to eradicate the animal because that's where that pathogen lives. And in some instances, that's just impractical to do. You can't, you can't eradicate every pig on earth. You can't eradicate every crow or, or, or bird that harbors a particular pathogen uh, or every insect. Imagine that. I mean, there's just no way you can do that. So that's all the more important to understand the, the, the life cycle of these pathogens and get a better understanding of can we somehow intervene in some way um, to control those, those particular um, pathways. And, and sometimes we can't, it just, it's impossible to do. So here's that table I was referring to a moment ago where we're looking at various um, agents here, whether they're viruses or bacteria or miscellaneous, um, most of these are helminth worms. Some of the common uh, diseases that, that maybe you've heard of, some of these. And the primary reservoir, primary animal reservoir that that virus or that bacterium is, is, is part of, it lives within. It doesn't necessarily make the animal sick, okay? It's just endemic. It's common in the biology of that rodent or that chicken or that dog or that tick. It's not uncommon to find it there. Uh, and then finally, how is it transmitted? So let's look at a few of these, including rabies. We've all heard of rabies, right? A very, very nasty viral infection. Um, <clears throat> rabies is, is more common in certain animals than in others, but mammals typically harbor rabies. And if the, if the rabid dog or the rabid raccoon bites you, um, you better seek immediate medical attention because it can be fatal. There's some very, very sad cases of people who've been bitten by wild animals and typically these these animals that are rabid are just not behaving properly they they're just they look perhaps like um they're unhealthy the the fur just is very matted down or maybe they're even losing fur and the animal is out in the middle of the day and it's wandering about and making sounds and it's just very a atypical behavior that's what you got to be very careful of um, so if you ever see an animal like that steer clear of it um, influenza, I simply starred that because we've all had the flu. And as I mentioned earlier, most all flu viruses start in pigs. They also list chickens here, but I'm more familiar with the fact that pigs are a common reservoir for most influenza viruses. And notice that this is airborne. You, in, you inhale um, those flu particles and that's how you can get it. Um, here's a West Nile virus. I was mentioning that a few minutes ago and the dead crows. So the mosquito is actually what bites the crow and makes the crow die because it passes on the virus to the crow and it bites it. So mosquitoes bite, you know, not just humans, they can bite other, other animals too, and they do. Um, let's see what else we have here. Here's Salmonella. Harvard in different animals, mammals, birds, and rodents. So if, if you, and we could probably also even list certain, well, this is this is animal reservoirs, but plants can also harbor some of these things too. I was just thinking about the, the contaminated uh, spinach or what lettuce or whatever it might be too. So um, this is focusing of course on animals. Uh, ringworm, maybe you've heard of that. Many domesticated animals can harbor ringworm, dogs and cats. Uh, here's trypanosomiasis, the reduvid bug, the kissing bug, and the tsetse fly carrying a, a particular type of trypanosome. Uh, trichinosis, swine and bears. That's interesting. I didn't know about bears. I know about swine. If you eat undercooked pork, and you ingest the cyst, you can come down with this nasty trichinosis parasite. Same occurs for, for tapeworm. If you eat 
undercooked fish, pork, or beef. Um, you can get tapeworm. So interesting to look at different zoonotic infections. So how do we acquire and how are some of these infectious agents transmitted? We've talked a little bit about carriers. So when we talk about communicable diseases, of course, I think you all have a sense of what that means. When a disease is communicable, it can be passed on from infected host to other hosts, and that can then become established in the, the second host, right? The person that's never been infected with it, but now gets sick. And some of these communicable diseases are contagious, meaning, of course, highly communicable. It's easy to catch it. Uh, measles is extremely contagious. Others are less contagious, less likely to be um, acquired. Non-communicable, not arising through transmission from host to host. So how do you get it? Well, think about this. If you are an immunocompromised individual, for whatever reason, it's possible that your own microbial flora could be the source of the infection. Actually, we've talked a little bit about that earlier in the chapter, right? So you get the bacterium from yourself, not under normal healthy conditions, but if your system, your immune system, for example, is compromised because of illness or disease, that can set the stage for secondary infections Again, non-communicable. I don't have to worry about giving it to somebody else. I'm getting it from my own self. Um, contact with organisms in natural non-living reservoir. So here we're talking about if you were to inhale certain types of spores, be they fungal or even bacterial spores, or scratching, getting, getting a cut on a barbed wire fence um, could introduce pathogens. You're not going to transmit that infection to the neighbor, you got it because you were unlucky enough to have cut yourself. And that particular um, opening provided a portal of entry for a particular pathogen. So this simply talks more about communicable diseases and how they can be sometimes indirect through say, in inanimate objects like doorknobs, you touch a doorknob, you touch a toilet seat, the old proverbial dirty toilet seat, right? Even though we found when we swap toilet seats that they're pretty darn clean. Um, but there are a number of, of sources, inanimate objects, um, you know, um, cutting boards, right? When you cut chicken, um, you know, you should always make sure you clean that cutting board really, really well. It could be an indirect source of transmission from you know, one food source to another food source. Um, a cough, a sneeze, if that turns into what we refer to as droplet nuclei, that can be carried in the air. It can stay suspended in the room air for a period of several hours, actually. Some, some infectious uh, pathogens um, actually, yeah, they're airborne. They can stay in the air. And if you walk into a room and you inhale that air and you inhale a sufficient number uh, of viral particles, if we have a low infectious dose, for example, you run the risk of getting that infection. Um, direct is pretty obvious, you know, direct interaction, whether it's kissing or intercourse, you know, kick it more, more direct than that is a, a means by which pathogens can, can be transmitted from one individual to another. Um, we talked about um, storch, remember, earlier in the chapter and how certain pathogens can move from the mother's bloodstream across the placenta and infect the fetus. And of course, obviously, the biting mosquito or biting arthropod. Uh, we list sneeze here as well. Now, we talked about it as an indirect transmission route. But it could also be direct in the sense that if you're in uh, at a party and somebody next to you sneezes, um, 
and you inhale that air, you could obviously then suffer the ill effects of that cold virus or, or whatever the pathogen might be. So that's one of those exposures that could be both direct or indirect. And this kind of talks a little bit about that too. So I'll let you read over that slide. Okay, let's get into this field of epidemiology, which of course was the uh, heading at the beginning of today's lecture. This is a super interesting branch of science that employs all sorts of different individuals. It's not you know, just the physician, it could employ psychologists, statisticians, um, sociologists, um, mathematicians. There's just a whole slew of individuals who are part of this process of looking at how disease is distributed within a community or within a population. And of course, one important aspect of epidemiology, which we're, we're living through in COVID-19, this is just a super example of how important epidemiology is, is to do adequate surveillance, collecting data. What is the prevalence of the disease in the population? How should we be um, coming up with particular um, you know, laws or policies to minimize the spread of that particular pathogen? I mean, there, it just goes to show how important monitoring, surveillance, collecting data, reporting on that in a timely way, um, looking at the mortality rate. We'll be talking more about these terms in a minute. Mortality, morbidity, frequency, prevalence in the population. How is it transmitted? Um, it's just a multifaceted approach to studying diseases and how they are spread and how they impact people. We've all heard about the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, this governmental agency, which has been unfortunately under attack uh, the last few years by uh, a previous Republican administration um, that did not put much faith in science and the role that science plays in following the, the and monitoring this, this terrible pandemic we're in. Um, uh, when I was growing up, the Centers for Disease Control, up until, as they say, 2016, was the blue ribbon, well, super well-respected organization throughout the entire world. And it still is, in my mind. It's, it's, it's coming back in terms of um, public trust, I think. It's, it took a hit. Um, but this is a group of, of dedicated professionals who, who devote their lives to study infections and how to prevent infections from getting into populations. You've probably also heard of the World Health Organization or WHO, which as the name implies is a more global uh, agency, but the CDC works closely with the WHO and other um, countries, um, you know, uh, versions of the CDC. There's a whole network of, of, uh, of folks out there that, that are talking to one another, communicating, working for the, to the, for the good of us all. So let's describe a few or define a few terms as it relates to epidemiology. The term frequency, I think is self-explanatory. We're talking here about the number of cases. And prevalence is sort of a subset of frequency. We're talking here about the, the accumulated total of existing cases with respect to the entire population. What is the prevalence of influenza? in the state of New York? What is the prevalence of AIDS in the United States? What is the prevalence of COVID-19 in Cattaraugus County? So we can look at this in a number of different ways. Depends upon what our population study you know, involves. Is it local or is it more broad? Is it global even? Incidents. This gets at the number of new cases that are appearing over time within the general population. This gets back to the, the importance of surveillance and careful monitoring and reporting of data. Again, think of COVID-19. Think about 
the early months of the infection back in the spring of 2020 when uh, Governor Cuomo of New York had daily briefings, as did other governors, I suppose, but but of course, being in New York, we're more in tune with what's going on here uh, in our state. But if you ever watched any of those um, daily briefings, um, he talked about the incidence of COVID within New York State. And so we can look at that in a number of different ways. Certainly providing um, a graph is a nice pictorial way that we can all kind of, uh, you know, glean that information visually quite quickly as opposed to having a table of data, which is a little more difficult to, to kind of see the trends. But <clears throat> here we're looking at coronavirus in 2020. Uh, again, from March through April, this is in the United States and then state of New York. And um, we kind of see how that progressed over time, the number of new cases added at various times from March through middle of April. Mortality rate, this is getting at the number of deaths in the population, mortality. Um, this is not COVID-19, this is just something that I, I found on the internet. Uh, age adjusted diseases of the circulatory system mortality rate per 100,000 population from 1980 to 2015. Oftentimes what they do is they they um, rate it per X number of individuals in the population. And so 100,000 is often a standard. So um, this again is uh, appears to be um, global because they're talking about the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and France here. But we also see the United States listed here in green. And obviously, as we look at the time from 1980 through 2015, there's been a fairly steady decline, hasn't there, in age-related diseases of the circulatory system. This doesn't tell you why, it just gives you the data. And uh, there are other lighter colored lines here as well, of course. So this is an average. And here, of course, we see how we in the United States compare to the average. And again, interesting to note a very similar decrease in mortality, which is a good thing. Morbidity is the number of new, not new cases, but the number of cases of individuals who are afflicted with that disease. Doesn't tell you how many are dying. Doesn't tell you, tell you how many are, are being added. It's just saying how many there are within a given time frame. Okay, so this is looking at two things, not just morbidity, but also mortality. And this is of cases of malaria in the Philippines from 1990 through 2004. So we have the population of the Philippines. We have the number of confirmed cases. Here we're looking again at the rate per 100,000. As I said, this is a, a fairly standard norm from which to, to do the statistical analysis. And then here we're looking at the number of people that have died confirmed cases of deaths in, in the Philippines. And here we're looking at a rate per, again, 100,000. And so what's kind of interesting is that as we see the morbidity rates decline over those 14 or so years, we also note, not unexpectedly, that if the number of people afflicted with malaria is decreasing, the number of deaths is likewise decreasing. And certainly you can see that borne out in the data as well. Um, so sometimes data is presented in a, in a tabular sort of way, and, and that's not a bad thing. But I think, again, as I said earlier, it's often nice to put that into a graph where you can visually kind of see that rise, or in this case, the decline. This depends on, on who is presenting the data and how they're presenting the data. Uh, and so again, this is a nice segue into this next slide, which simply says that there are a, a whole slug of different ways to present the data, whether it's in the ta table form, the statistical numbers uh, provided, or whether it's in a graphical form, or we can sometimes use bar graphs to illustrate particular types of data, or we can actually use, again, here we're looking at HIV infection in adults um, in the United States. The darker the color, the higher the incidence rate, right? So this gives you 
obviously a sense of which states have the highest incidence rate of AIDS. It also gives you a geographic sense. And this is kind of cool. The fact that you know the upper Midwest and the Rocky Mountain states have a much lower incidence rate than say does the East and Southeast. So this brings up a lot of other questions and that is, well, what's causing that? Is it because there's, there's a higher population on the East Coast? Probably that's the reason, right? Much less populous states in the, in the Midwest and in the West. Most of our population centers in the United States are in the Eastern half of the US. Now with the exception of Texas and some parts of California. But uh, again, different ways of presenting data. Um, patterns of infection, endemic. An endemic disease is one that has a fairly steady frequency of infection over time. It stays pretty steady. It doesn't vary a whole lot from year to year. Here we're looking at something called valley fever. And I, I do not know what valley fever is, to be quite honest. You could look it up. I'm not sure that the book says a whole lot about it. Um, but we do know that it is in a fairly steady incidence rate. If we look at you know, the southern half of California along the border of Arizona and New Mexico and then southwestern Texas. So it wouldn't surprise me if this has something to do with, um, well, I shouldn't say, I just don't know. But it seems to have some, some similar um, you know, climactic uh, impacts here, perhaps. Desert, Southwest kind of thing. But it does indicate, I did look it up, that you get it from inhaling um, probably the spores of a particular type of fungus. A sporadic infection is a pattern that is random. Occasional cases popping up at irregular intervals. And they use the example of typhoid fever caused by salmonella. So it's scattered, spread somewhat sporadically. If you were to take another snapshot of typhoid fever at a different time, I'm not sure when this was you know, based upon, um, you might have dots up here and <clears throat> in the upper Midwest, let's say, and, and maybe none in the East. So as the name implies, sporadic. Endemic, or epidemic, excuse me. An epidemic, we all have heard of that term. We're in the midst of one, hopefully on the downhill side of the COVID epidemic, is where we have the incidence rate increasing. Now, we, we hear about um, surges, right? Some states are in the middle of a third surge of COVID, meaning that the numbers are going up. And that seems to be a, an issue with regard to laxed use of masks, people getting together. Um, there's a whole host of reasons that have been proposed as to why these um, spikes are taking place. Um, it's not necessarily surprising to many health professionals, epidemiologists, who could have predicted that once you loosen some of those uh, restrictions, that you're going to start to see surges. We also can talk about pandemics. COVID-19 is a pandemic. We know that origin it originated in China and then eventually spread throughout the world. Right? It's everywhere. There's no place on earth you, you can go today um, and not find evidence of COVID-19. Um, where we have less numbers of people traveling would indicate less likelihood of the spread. You gotta have people spreading this, right? So if, if nobody ever goes to um, Iceland, which is not true because people do go to Iceland, or Antarctica, let's say, um, if no one ever traveled to Antarctica on scientific missions uh, prior to COVID-19, it wouldn't go there, right? People have to travel there. That's how the virus spreads. But as I said, I don't think there's any place on earth <clears throat> today that probably doesn't have COVID. This is uh, an article from the Atlantic Magazine. It was written a couple of years ago, but I, I think it's fascinating I would like you to check it out. It's a fairly short article uh, entitled, The Next Plague is Coming, 
is America ready? And some would argue the next epidemic is coming. Is America ready? Um, yeah, we, we've just unfortunately lived through what some people would say is a very rare occurrence. And I'm not saying it's not, because the last major pandemic, of course, was the Spanish flu in the early 1900s. So it's been over 100 years. But we really should not have been surprised that this occurred, because if you look at history of, of pandemics in, in the world, they're fairly regular. They, they occur not infrequently. They don't occur every year or every 10 years, right? But they do occur, and they're not going to stop occurring. They may actually um, be more frequent in certain instances. Um, nosocomial infections or hospital-acquired infections, HAIs. Here we're talking, of course, about particular bacteria and, and, and or viruses, even for that matter, and how they can be spread during the time you're in a hospital having surgery, let's say, or treatment for some uh, disease, cancer treatment perhaps. We often think of the hospital as being a safe place to go. Uh, nothing can be further from the truth. The last place that I wanna go is a hospital if I can avoid it because there's lots of infectious you know, bugs floating around, right? Um, so, Hospitals and nursing homes and other healthcare facilities put policies in place to try to minimize these hospital acquired infections or nosocomial infections. Because if you look at the number of cases a year in the United States of confirmed, studied uh, infections passed from one patient to another, one to two million cases with 72,000 deaths associated with infections. You go into the hospital for surgery, you come home with an infection, and you die from that infection. 72,000. That's not an insignificant number of infections. That's a lot of people. We don't think about this very much. Um, and so what sorts of uh, tissues or or sources are these bugs coming from? So that's what this pie chart, of course, shows you. And it's, it's somewhat evenly split. I mean, you can see that respiratory tract is a big source, and that doesn't surprise us. It shouldn't be. Um, lots of bacteria are passed via the respiratory you know, tract, picked up by, by breathing in bacteria or exhaling that pathogen out. Some of these look familiar to you probably. Staph aureus, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, although staph aureus can also be passed through, through wounds, through uh, skin. GI tract, urinary tract infections, blood can be a source of pathogens. Um, it's, some, again, something that we should all be very, very mindful of and try to reduce the likelihood of these nosocomial infections. So what can we do? What's, what are the different levels of isolation that are used clinically? And that's what this kind of talks a little bit about. Some precautions that are set up before you can go visit somebody at the hospital or before you as a nurse can treat that patient. And it all depends upon the pathogen, the health of the individual. Um, you know, there's lots of, of extenuating circumstances that need to be carefully analyzed um, before we come up with a protective mechanism. Um, I think it's obviously safe to say you all realize the importance of gowns and gloves and, and, and facial barriers in some cases to avoid contamination or acquiring bacteria or viruses from patients. Um, strict isolation, somebody let's say who um, is harboring a particularly pathogenic bacterium where you know, the person, nobody goes into that room without gloves, masks, and gowns. And when you leave, those materials get decontaminated or autoclaved or destroyed. Um, somebody who's suffering from a burn would be in strict isolation because, of course, they're very susceptible not only to dehydration, but more importantly, to infection because the skin, as you know, while thin, is an effective barrier. Yeah. 
Um, the reverse isolation is really, really yeah, interesting protective isolation where we have these reverse um, laminar flow systems um, and, and highly effective HEPA filters that remove any of the airborne pathogens that are in the room. Yeah, so somebody who is undergoing chemotherapy, someone who's had a bone marrow transplant, um, somebody who's had a really severe burns would be placed into this, this uh, reverse isolation because any possible bacterium or virus that we could fight off with no trouble could kill, very likely could kill the patient. We've mentioned just a moment ago how blood can be a source of nosocomial infections. And so as all of you, I think, know that there are these universal precautions that must be used whenever there is any exposure uh, to blood, whether that's from a syringe uh, or from a wound uh, or, or from, uh, you know, it you know, could be almost any interaction um, that you might have as a healthcare provider to a patient because that, that, that blood could harbor all sorts of very potentially uh, nasty bugs. I think of you know, AIDS virus, of course, um, but there are others too. So in the bio lab, when we do blood studies in a &P one which um, some schools no longer do, but, but I feel personally that, that doing uh, blood typing or doing spinning down blood to look at the hematocrit or whatever the case may be uh, is really interesting. I, I think you guys appreciate the opportunity to see these things up close and personal as opposed to reading about it in a book. So uh, I have um, for 30 plus years um, done the blood studies. I've had students prick their finger if they want to do that and do this. But we do follow these very, very important precautions. We make sure that any of the lancets that we use are placed into the biohazard uh, containers. You've seen those in the bio lab, perhaps. And those, of course, are then uh, properly disposed of. OK, well, I think that uh, pretty much wraps up um, chapter 13 on microbe-human interactions. So uh, only two more chapters to go. The next one is the. Uh, introduction to host defenses and innate immunity. So you can start looking at those videos anytime you want.